introducing the next talk, just um, getting, extracting the lurking stories behind the numbers. Mr. Stefan Wehrmeyer will introduce, talk to us about computing numbers with an application to the problems of our society. Please give him a warm applause. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, obviously, this is a reference to a Turing paper. I got many questions, um, but those of you who got it, um, uh, thumbs up. Um, and this talk will basically combine computer science and, um, and journalism. Um, I'm currently a data journalist. I joined a newsroom uh, about one and a half years ago. It's called Corrective. It's a non-profit newsroom based in Berlin. Um, we do long-term investigations, and uh, we are member-based and uh, currently a bit foundation-funded. And uh, we are doing investigative journalism. Uh, investigative journalism, uh, w w what is that? Um, one good example now from popular culture will, will be this one. Um, this is uh, the movie uh, Spotlight that just came out in the US. It uh, will uh, come out soon in Germany. And it's uh, the story about child abuse uh, by the Catholic priests in, in the Boston metropolitan area. And uh, this is the team that um, basically uncovered it, um, or rather, it's not. Uh, these are the um, actors uh, that play uh, the investigative journalists. And uh, the whole film is actually a, a quite a good representation of how um, investigative journalists uh, work. Um, especially, so this film uh, depicts a story from uh, 2003, uh, 2001, 2000, uh, I think 2001. And, um, yeah, it's a bit uh, slightly over-dramatized, of course, because it's like a Hollywood film, but uh, it actually depicts uh, um, investigative journalists um, uh, quite uh, accurately. Um, uh, of course, it also dep depicts the gender balance quite accurately, um, as you uh, can see here. Uh, but it is getting better. Um, um, so in Germany, for example, uh, the leading data uh, teams um, from uh, Spiegel, um, Bayerische Rundfunk, and SRF in uh, Switzerland um, are led by women, and also the uh, organization that uh, represents investigative journalists in Germany has uh, mostly women uh, on its board. So um, sin still many uh, investigative journalists, um, like too many are still men, uh, so uh, women get into the field uh, uh, as well. Um, so the Spotlight team, uh, so what they did is they uh, uh, got a tip and then they looked at data. Um, they collected data uh, about priests who were moving between the different parishes, so the different uh, districts in the metropolitan area of Boston. Um, every time there was an abuse scandal, they got a sick leave or uh, something similar and got moved to a different district uh, to cover up um, uh, the scandal and to make it appear that it's just like a single case. Uh, uh, the truth would be that um, they discovered that many more cases uh, were present, uh, were, were, um, present and they, um, they basically uncovered that it was like a systemic problem. And this is actually uh, one of the core pieces of investigative journalism that you don't show um, that a single thing is wrong, like this uh, man did something bad, but that the whole system is set up in a way uh, that uh, many people do many bad things. And um, uh, so they actually, they used uh, books um, that um, displayed where priests were moving, um, like where is the priest in which year, that like uh, a, a book for every year, and then they went through it and uh, typed it in a computer, and they actually had like, a nice spreadsheet in the end uh, which uh, uh, displayed where priests were moving. So investigative journalists and computers are like a, a perfect match. Um, of course, computers are used in many other areas of journalism. Uh, every, every publishing uh, is now, um, every major newspaper also has a website, of course. Um, there's now robot journalism coming up where uh, sport teams, uh, um, so sports events are covered by, by computer programs, not by humans anymore. Um, but what I'm specifically talking about here is investigative journalism, um, a term that started as uh, precision journalism or database journalism, computer-assisted reporting, data-driven journalism is the current term, and there's also like computational journalism. All these terms basically uh, mean that you use um, a computer to do an investigative story. And um, Philip Meyer, one of the first um, uh, investigative journalists who used a computer, said a journalist has to be a database manager. Um, so we can't quite compare a database admin uh, with a journalist, um, but uh, it, it's getting closer. So a, a journalist um, has to have its facts. Uh, they have their facts. And um, of course, there are too many facts to keep uh, just in their mind, so you have to put it in a computer. 
Um, and now I will basically present a couple of, uh, of fields in computer science that uh, investigative journalists use um, to make their stories happen. Uh, one of the big ones is, of course, uh, natural language processing. Um, you know, the Snowden leaks, or um, if you might remember, the, the offshore leaks and uh, a couple of leaks that, follows, uh, that followed. When you have a, a big leak of data or you got a, a, a big leak of documents or you got documents uh, via freedom of information request, um, these are like uh, thousands, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe even more documents that you get either in paper form um, or uh, as PDFs, and what do you do with them? You can't possibly read them all. Um, um, they, the, the, the current newsrooms, they don't have, have enough staff, they don't have uh, um, enough time to um, uh, spend on, this, uh, on these investigations, and uh, so they have to use um, computers to uh, make this uh, job a bit easier. Natural language processing is um, perfect for that. You just put the, all the documents you have, uh, Inside the computer, you have to possibly uh, OCR them, uh, and then um, a couple of things uh, might work in your favor. Uh, so there's entity extraction, of course, um, that uh, finds out, okay, the, uh, these documents uh, contain these entities, and um, so it's not only Mr. Obama, but also President Obama, Barack Obama, and then you can basically extract these entities and know which documents talk about which entities um, you can extract. Uh, who, uh, if, for example, in the email dump, who's talking with who, um, or uh, also um, company names. Uh, this is like easily is extracted uh, with, e with entity extraction techniques. There's deduplication, um, there's topic modeling, so you know, okay, these documents talk about these topics, and um, so I don't have to read them. If I want to focus my story on this specific topic, I go down uh, this path and uh, only look at the uh, documents that are basically automatically categorized in a certain category. And uh, part of speech tagging is often also quite useful when you uh, look at a, do a document, for example, debates, uh, you want to find out uh, when, uh, who's talking about what in, in what kind of way, uh, you can find out that out uh, with part of speech tagging. And of course, basic search. A search is always uh, quite useful. Not, um, uh, there are many advanced uh, ways to search and uh, your journalists have to use them to make sense of these uh, big document stacks. Um, of course, uh, in, uh, we have, uh, so, so uh, document uh, search has been a big uh, part of computer science uh, since um, like the 70s, 80s. Um, now, uh, nowadays we have like solar or elastic search or other search engines that uh, do that quite easily, but uh, these are made for computer programmers, right? We, we use um, them as developers, uh, set them up, um, configure them, and build our own backend uh, or front end on top uh, so that uh, other people can actually use the search behind it. Um, journalists have um, a couple of more, uh, they want to use a couple more features in there, and um, we have a um, couple of um, applications that help us there, uh, namely Document Cloud, uh, which is a service where you can upload lots of documents, and um, they are automatically uh, like made searchable, entities are extracted, and uh, then you can uh, also publish them uh, for your readers uh, to also look at them. Overview Docs, which uh, does uh, topic modeling, so you can uh, dive into your documents more easily. Uh, there's uh, a, the project Blacklight, which is basically a solar front end uh, that you can, um, so I, that I can use to give to my journalist colleagues and they can use uh, basically a solar search um, uh, in an easy way. And there's also, of course, Google Refine, uh, which is usually used for tabular data, but it also has a very good reconciliation backend and also clustering where you can do deduplication. So when, if you have like um, a list of uh, company names and they are like very dirty, you can um, reconciliate them or basically deduplicate them and uh, make all the, uh, the company names match again. Uh, there's also pro software, uh, namely Nuix or IBM Watson Analytics. Um, they are very expensive and um, most journalists uh, have never seen them and possibly can't use them. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to get your hands on them. Um, and that is quite sad uh, because uh, we have to, so journalists have to rely on these open source tools, which, uh, and there are only a few uh, that are actually made for investigations. And uh, to the computer science part, uh, I'm mostly talking now about um, uh, basically English language models. Uh, it's very difficult to find good German models that are already integrated in some kind of software, so you can use them um, in the, in the German-speaking world. Um, and that uh, kind of, I hope that uh, changes soon. 
Then there's uh, machine learning, um, which is uh, mostly, mostly used for classification tasks. Um, it's another big field, of course, in the computer science area, um, uh, in statistical analysis uh, to find out uh, what belongs to which cate category. Um, and of course, there's a bit of neural net deep learning uh, coming now our way. You can see there's been some deep dreaming in this, uh, in this picture. Um, but uh, I haven't seen like, any journalistic piece uh, that has used that uh, uh, yet. Um, I, I worked a bit on uh, something where I use uh, like, uh, neural nets to uh, crack some captures for some databases to scrape them better. Um, but this is uh, still in the making. Uh, here's one story uh, that actually used uh, natural language processing and machine learning um, in order to uh, identify uh, police reports of the uh, Los Angeles Police Department, which misclassified uh, over 25,000 um, uh, crimes. So when a policeman comes to a, uh, or a police officer comes to a crime scene and um, he writes down a report, uh, it gets later um, put into a database and then classified um, by another clerk. And uh, they, classifies, uh, they classify the, the crime that happened as a minor or serious or another category. And based on the description, um, uh, the Los Angeles Times uh, wrote a machine learning uh, classifier uh, that looked at um, basically the description of the crime and a, a proper classification and trained it on a, on a uh, training data set and then used the whole data set to look if uh, all the other crimes were properly classified, and uh, they were apparently misclassified, over 25,000 of them. And of course, you can't go through all these records and you know, uh, classify them by hand. A machine can do that uh, much more easily. And it has also been confirmed by the police department that there has been a misclassification going on. Uh, the result is that many, the crime statistic is much uh, lower and less serious, uh, more minor crimes and serious crimes. And um, you can basically cover that up um, through misclassification. And the Los Angeles time, uh, Times could uh, uncover that uh, through machine learning. Um, then there's uh, this big field of uh, social network analysis, uh, a favorite topic of uh, Mr. Friedrich Lindenberg, uh, here in the uh, second row. Um, and it, it, social network analysis is basically um, the, the bread and butter of uh, every journalist's work. We are collecting information about certain entities and we are trying to find their connections. And um, this is then uh, basically uh, put into, um, you can put that into a, a, uh, a chart like that. So this is like a network graph. Um, the problem with that is um, the result is mostly not journalism. Uh, it's, it's just a research database. You collected some facts and uh, then, they are, uh, then you can display them like that. Um, but it's also very subjective data collection um, because you only, basically cover the connections you uh, think are important and you po possibly don't see any others. And um, it, it's, it's more like a knowledge management tool where you can you know, collect uh, everything you know uh, to better collaborate with your fellow journalists. Um, but as a, as a result, it's, it might not be journalism. Um, so we can't say, um, okay, I got this big um, graph and now I do an, an eigen, eigenvalue centrality measure and then I found the bad guy. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So you can't like compute um, um, the, the bad guy out of such a, such a graph. What you need to do is uh, do like proper journalism on top. Um, so you have, uh, you have like a knowledge graph and then you can look at it and then you can interview people, you can find out um, more through um, uh, like proper, like, like um, old school, let's say, uh, investigative uh, work. Um, so what you hear in the, see in the background is uh, the lobby radar, which is, has been now uh, shut down. It used to be uh, run by uh, the ZTF. And, um, but this is more like a, like, a, like a piece of art than you know, gives you an actual insight here. It's, um, uh, it's uh, difficult to make social network, uh, networks appear as, um, as uh, make them understandable, let's say. And then there's a brand new field of algorithmic accountability. We also heard like, for example, talk about the VW uh, diesel gate scandal um, is a, a topic of algorithmic uh, accountability. Um, more and more alg algorithms are put into every device we know and um, are making decisions um, that affect all of our lives. And um, 
now we have some hackers that um, do some reverse engineering, and that is great, and then they present at Congress. But of course, this is basically journalistic work, and we need to bring uh, these techniques into the newsrooms. Um, the newsrooms need to understand, uh, the investigative journalists need to understand how this stuff works and uh, how to reverse engineer it. Um, Nick Diakopoulos, um, a researcher uh, in, the, in Washington, I think, um, uh, did, did a lot of uh, work on that. And um, for example, uh, one uh, thing was uh, uh, stock trading plans of executives that are pre-planned. Uh, you can analyze how the, the plan works and if, it, like, if insider trading is behind it. Or for example, uh, how does the iPhone autocorrect uh, work? Uh, you, you can uh, observe the output, you can observe the input, what, what's happen what is happening inside. Um, um, another uh, example would be uh, how are prices um, displayed in, uh, on retail sites for different geographical areas, for example. And um, analyzing that is um, not an easy task, but it's becoming more and more important, especially uh, if there's not much uh, transparency around um, how these things work. Um, so journalism becomes, um, um, gets closer to science, let's say. Um, the investi uh, investigations in, in journalism, uh, they use the investigative met method. Um, you also have a hypothesis, like in science. Um, you, you, um, you make up something, um, like uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, kids are um, underprivileged because of uh, corruption going on in the school system. And then you have to prove that hypothesis. And um, so it's, it's very similar to science. And um, uh, science also moves now into um, a, a more reproducible and transparent manner. Uh, the story I uh, told you earlier about the LAPD, um, this is the code um, that was um, used for this um, story. You have a, a, like a classifier, a machine learning classifier of a support vector machine, and um, um, you can basically run the code yourself um, to train the classifier and then uh, class classify some of these reports. Um, they only publish like a tiny training data set and um, uh, only parts of the data, but they basically make their methodology uh, transparent. And um, this is um, basically also where science is going. Many, um, many research papers nowadays are not reproducible, but they, they should be. And uh, this is a Jupyter notebook, and you can basically create um, a, a prose and code mix and then uh, execute it and uh, look at the result. And anyone else can also reproduce your work. Um, so this is Python, but also R is uh, are like favorite languages of uh, investigative journalists in, in the data area. Then one uh, big thing I discovered uh, was um, that software engineering in the newsroom is not that easy. Um, first of all, uh, of course, there's IT support and th there's the problem of, of a, a CMS. Uh, so the content management system is always a problem. Um, uh, as, a, as a software engineer, you basically always fight uh, the CMS. Um, uh, in, in big organizations like the New York Times, they basically create their own hacks just so that they can put their beautiful graphics in the um, rest of the CMS. They, um, um, it's like big hacks going on there. but um, this is, uh, this is not what I want to talk about. Um, software engineering in the newsroom is basically also building tools for your fellow journalists. Um, and that hasn't uh, fully, uh, um, ha uh, it doesn't have its roots, uh, so software engineering doesn't have its roots in the newsroom. And that's why it's a bit difficult um, at the moment. Uh, right now, a journalist writes an article and then it's published and then you can forget about it. Uh, you never touch it again, so there's no technical debt in articles. Um, code um, is, um, so sometimes code in newsrooms is also written for a single story. So you write code for that story, you publish it, and then you forget about it. But of course, as software engineers, we learn that is not how to do things. We want to we don't want to write the same code again for the next story. We want to have something reusable. We want to fix the bug only once here. We don't want to fix it uh, a million times over all of our, our articles. And um, that means we uh, need to uh, cl clean up a bit and um, uh, develop some kind of, um, some kind of method uh, to write uh, software in the newsroom. It's currently um, quite, a, quite a hack uh, as I perceive it. Um, and then uh, computer science papers. Um, I, I, lo I love to read them. They have very interesting ideas, but mostly they don't come with code. Um, 
and when they come with code, uh, it's not running code. It's difficult to actually make that run. And w when I actually compiled that uh, C library to make uh, machine uh, learning a bit faster, um, it's still not usable software. So I can't give it to my colleague to actually use um, uh, what I compiled there. And um, this is uh, definitely something that also uh, so I, I hope that um, when you publish something in computer science that, um, I don't know, you, you give me something that I can use to actually bring into my newsroom uh, to make their lives easier. Um, also, collaboration, um, which is something that is basically innate to the open source uh, software scene, um, is uh, a bit more difficult in newsrooms. Uh, there's always the competition going on. Um, the investig especially investigative journalists are, um, are used to per be perceived as lone wolves. Uh, if you are onto a story and someone else um, has heard of it, you better publish soon because um, the other uh, guy might you know, uh, scoop you on it and then uh, your story is burned and you can't publish it anymore. And all the work you did for that was in vain. Um, instead, in, uh, on the other hand, in, in open source software, it's great if many people collaborate on a piece of software. Um, the, the higher the bus count is, uh, the better. And um, so we need to basically bring this idea of collaboration uh, into the newsroom. And uh, this uh, is also still um, yeah, uh, a problem that, is, is, that it is not uh, quite uh, there yet. Um, there are some collaborations now between the New York Times and the Washington Post, for example, or um, the ProPublica uh, news organization and uh, uh, another um, bigger publication in the US, I think. Uh, and um, as Corrective, we also collaborate with many other news organizations to, uh, that they publish our stories um, with us together. And uh, we hope that this uh, idea of collaboration um, that is basically a, a software idea, as I perceive it, uh, is also coming into um, the publishing of news stories. Um, and uh, uh, another big problem is uh, that we have some software and we m might as well gonna use it. Um, and th if there's no other software, I, I can only use what I have. So the hammer nail problem is, is definitely something that is uh, in the newsroom. Um, have you ever seen like a map in a, in a in some kind of news article with lots of points on them. Um, that's because uh, the journalist uh, that did the story had this basically this map mapping tool where they could put in like a bunch of data and then it put it on a map, uh, even though it might not make any sense regarding to the story. Um, they just use the tool that they have. Or for example, a timeline, right? Uh, timelines are also like, there's an easy tool to make a timeline and then you have a timeline, even though it might not be the best way to present your story. Um, it's just the tool that is there, and uh, develop, developing another tool might not uh, fit the deadline um, or like your re resources. So I basically say um, we need more applications for our society, and um, many advances in computer science uh, are quite slow to benefit the public at large. Um, if there is like a big jump uh, in, let's say, machine learning, uh, Google knows it first. Um, because they do the research, they develop the applications, and uh, other, uh, other big uh, companies like, I don't know, Palantir, um, the NSA, uh, or um, ad companies, they basically use the latest um, research um, to do uh, better user tracking or better targeting. And um, so they benefit quicker from these developments, and so because they do their own research or because they have more resources. Um, many cutting edge research uh, um, is basically comes out of these corporations like Google. Um, for example, recently TensorFlow from, from Google Brain uh, got released. It's a, like a machine learning library. There are other machine learning, learning libraries, but this is like one that is um, very usable. And it is an advantage uh, that um, it's better supported, better documented, easier to use. But it might not exactly fit uh, the journalistic use case. Um, and so journalism needs more resources uh, to develop uh, their own tools. The, the tools I, um, I mentioned, like Document Cloud or Overview Docs, uh, are quite good. They are basically targeted at journalists. They're developed, developed by journalists, and um, they, they fit the use case quite well. But it took like six-figure amounts, as I recall, um, to develop them over the years. Um, it was very difficult to basically get the use case right. Um, for example, Google Refine, uh, like an invaluable tool to many journalists um, to work with tabular data and clean it. Um, it's really used a lot. 
but um, it was developed by Google and then open sourced, and that basically means it hasn't seen a release in two years. Um, and that is kind of, uh, kind of bad, that we are, don't have the resources to basically work on the tools that we use in the journalistic trade every day. So uh, my call to you is support journalism as a service to the public um, and help journalists uh, develop, develop the tools. Um, what we have here is basically a, a public good, journalism. Um, we try to make, um, uh, we try to be uh, in the service of the public. Um, so, for example, join a newsroom if you can. Um, it, it's really a fun work. Uh, so when I joined the, uh, I joined a newsroom simply because I think it's basically the uh, the best political activism I can do um, with the most impact. Uh, not only focus on technical topics. We hear lots about um, data retention and uh, I don't know uh, other data topics. But when you work in a newsroom, you get like a very broad range of topics from all over society, and you can still help with data um, literacy. Um, and another uh, and another hint. Um, so if you want to get in touch with journalists, there's uh, a thing called Hacks Hackers, which is a meetup. Um, that is in um, every big city in, um, in Germany. Okay, I think it's only in uh, Berlin and Hamburg. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that there's like a, a data journalism also in, uh, in North Rhine Westphalia. Um, and, but uh, if you're from any place else, like in New York, London, they all have hacks, hackers meetups. Hacks are the journalists, and hackers are, yeah, we are the hackers. And um, they come together there to uh, meet and talk about technology and journalism. And uh, so if you want to have uh, like an idea of what's, what's going on in that world, um, join a Hacks Hackers meetup and, um, I don't know, improve journalism uh, by contributing your ideas. Thank you. So I think we have uh, time for questions. We have a question from the internet, please. Where's the internet? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, the internet is asking many things. <laughs> and, uh, actually, yeah, from the Actually, internet. the most important question is, is your data mining software available as free software? And please mention some of the names of the tools you have used. Uh, so my data mining software. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't write a data. So I always did write data mining software, basically, and that is a problem. For every story, you write like a script that does it, and um, that has advantages because you can customize it. It has disadvantages because you have to write the software, and it's not quick and easy. Um, for example, we as in our newsroom, we publish all our work on, on GitHub um, at github.com slash corrective. And uh, you can have a look basically at um, software that is uh, there. Mostly it's just uh, front end stuff, but uh, we will also publish more basically back end data, so data analysis uh, pieces uh, in the future. And uh, many news organizations have uh, repositories on GitHub that explain how they do their stuff. Um, and how, uh, you can find their software there. Um, and the other question was, tools or something. Um, so I mentioned TensorFlow is a machine learning library, but there are like many, many tools for journalists that are mostly, they're, they're not tools that are like more libraries. So um, I'm using Pandas for Python, but there are also very, very, uh, a, a lot of R packages that you can use for data analysis. But the problem is that uh, nerds are a minority in the newsroom. And that means that um, uh, if you want your journalists to use these uh, tools, uh, use these techniques, you have to write tools to make them usable for like the normal people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> for the normal people? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not that nerds are not normal people, but yeah. We have another question. Come here, please. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, you've been talking a lot about net language processing tools, machine learning tools. And all of those, of course, know, are known to fail to produce errors, to misqualify, uh, mis uh, mis classify. classify, that's the word, yeah. And even if they classify correctly, it's not always easy to see what the classification actually means. You alluded to that shortly when talking about graphs and saying you don't only look for the central person in a graph and that's the bad guy. So how do you, de how do you deal with that risks, with misclassification, with with like, and also the illusion that the data could provide you some knowledge or insight that actually is not in the data or only apparently is there. 
um, yeah, cross cross checking, um, uh, like normal cross checking you do with data, um, like check your data before you put it in there for uh, certain things. Uh, Quartz recently published a long list uh, of how you interview your data to make sure it's. Um, uh, it's uh, up to a certain standard or that you're at least aware of its uh, failures. Many times already the input data is, is flawed in many ways. Um, and then um, your methodologies, of course, double check it, um, talk to experts um, that know more about uh, this field than you do. And um, by publishing the methodologies, you basically make yourself vulnerable but also transparent. So if there's something um, bad going on, um, your readers or any uh, other interested party can uh, basically run what you did and then tell you about uh, what you did wrong. Um, so any of these machine learning things it does not uh, lift the journalistic um, um, so as a journalist, you still have to uh, validate uh, your, your findings uh, through um, like second means or uh, at least do a, um, um, a check on a bigger sample. Um, so it, it definitely um, the result is not coming out of the computer. The result is uh, coming out of the human uh, mind. Um, so uh, the, the, the result of a research is, is, is not basically the output uh, to stand it out. Thank you so much. I think uh, we are all done now for the minutes we have for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Yes.